I would like to welcome His Excellency, Mr. Mohammed Shtayeh, the Prime Minister of Palestine. Prime Minister, warm welcome to our Foreign Affairs Committee, and good that you are connected. We understand that because of the pandemic, you will speak remotely from Ramallah. I would also like to welcome your ambassador here on the ground from the, uh, the deputy head of mission, Mr. Adel Ati, who's also following our meeting and is sitting here in the room. Prime Minister, our exchange of views today is a valuable opportunity to discuss the recent announcement that general elections could actually take place in Palestine in the next six months. We would also like to hear more from you about the request made by President Abbas to the Secretary General of the United Nations during his speech in the UN General Assembly. President Abbas asked the United Nations Secretary General to make preparations for an international conference early next year with the participation of all concerned parties to engage in a genuine peace process based on international law. We would like to hear about the long-term view of the Palestinian Authority for the Middle East process and the role which the European Union could have both in the conference requested by President Abbas and in facilitating a return to renewed direct negotiations between Israel and the Palestinian Authority for a two-state solution. Prime Minister, of course, you may wish to raise many, many more topics. I would just like to ask you if you could be so kind to try to stick to 15 minutes, as many of my colleagues have asked to take the floor, and I would like to ensure that there is sufficient time for a discussion today. Once again, Prime Minister, thank you for participating, and you now have the floor for 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, my dear friend, uh, David McAllister. And uh, thanks very much again for giving me the opportunity to speak to your distinguished committee on foreign affairs. Um, I think this meeting is very timely for us and for you. It is so important that we exchange ideas. And I will try to limit myself to 15 minutes, as you have recommended. And I will focus on the points that you've just mentioned. First of all, um, my dear friends, I would like you to watch the following roadmap between today and the uh, January 21st, 2021. This roadmap that is ahead of us has two important issues. One, whether Israel is going to go into a fourth elections, it seems this is likely because of the internal disputes within the Israeli political arena. On the second issue that we need to watch, you and us, is the November 3rd elections in the United States. These two important events will have very serious consequences on us, on the peace process, and on the future rule of Europe when it comes to the Middle East. Dear friends, four years have been really wasted we and you, we were waiting for the ultimate deal. And everybody was hoping that the ultimate deal will be really a deal and it will be ultimate. Unfortunately, it has not been. Four years of waiting have been really wasted because the ultimate deal has totally been rejected, not only by the Palestinians, but by the Arabs in general and by you in Europe, which the, the, the core of the ultimate deal, it did call for an accession of 30 percent of the Palestinian territory. This has not been accepted by Europe, this has not been accepted by Arab countries, and this has not been accepted by the Palestinians. Now, in addition for us to um, see where things are heading, heading, I think it will be very important to re really when we watch the outcome of the American elections. If we are going to live another four years with President Trump, God helps us, God helps you, and God helps the whole world. If things are going to change in the United States, I think this will reflect itself directly on the Palestinian-Israeli relationship. And it will reflect us, uh, it will reflect itself also on the bilateral Palestinian-American relationship. Remember, sir, that it has been, there has been very serious unilateral measures that has been taken by the Trump administration vis-a-vis -vis Palestine, including the closure of the Palestine office in Washington, stopping funding for United Nations Relief and Work Agency, UNRWA, 
stopping funding for the Palestinian Authority, as well as moving the embassy from uh, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. So these sort of unilateral measures that have been taken, we hope most of them, if not all, will be reversed by the uh, Biden administration if and only if elected. Now, Mr. Chairman, it might be useful to tell you that the person who is talking to you here on the chair of the Prime Minister of Palestine, I was actually the first Palestinian who landed in Madrid October 1991 for the peace talks. So I meant to say this to you because I want to tell you that we are the party to benefit most from any serious negotiations. We are the people under occupation. Our land is facing expropriation on a daily basis. The number of Jewish settlers on, is increasing on our territories. Number of settlements are increasing. So we are the party to benefit most from any serious negotiations. In order for us to do so, and maybe I should remind all of us that the lessons I have personally learned from this peace process since October 1991 in Madrid until recently, quite a number of important points. One, in order for us to have a successful peace process, I think we need an agreed upon terms of reference. It was only in Madrid that we had an agreed upon terms of reference. Since then, every American president, including President Trump, wanted to design his own terms of reference. President Bush, the son, in his press release or in his speech at Rose Garden in 2002, he came with his own terms of reference. President Clinton came with his own terms of reference, which he called, which came to be known as Clinton parameters. And then recently, President Trump came with his own terms of reference, which he called the ultimate deal or peace and prosperity for the region. None of these terms of reference has been, Mr. Chairman, none of it has been focused on international law. None of these terms of reference was based on United Nations resolutions. Therefore, we got lost. We and the Israelis were reading from different books. We are all the time, and we have been all the time, focusing on international law, United Nations resolutions. And I know you in Europe, you are the guarantors of international law, and when Palestine suffers, from lack of implementation of international law, Europe suffers as well, and the whole world does. On the other important point, there has never been an, a time frame. Mr. Chairman, this peace process has been ongoing since October 1991. That is 29 years of talking that has not produced a serious outcome. And so, therefore, if we are going to go anywhere, we need to have a clear terms of reference. When you are negotiating with, with England, with Britain, on Brexit, you have given a time frame. <clears throat> and you have maybe renewed the time frame, but I think time frames are so important in any future negotiations. The third important point that we need to look at is intentions. Mr. Chairman, when you hear the Prime Minister of Israel every now and then talking about, you know, uh, Palestinian territories as not occupied territory, as disputed territory, Palestinian territory as Judea and Samaria, that settlers are there to stay and not they will never be removed, that Jerusalem is the, is the united capital of the state of Israel. All these statements, they tell us one important thing, that the Prime Minister of Israel has no intentions whatsoever to really reach an agreement with the Palestinians. He doesn't recognize 1967 as borders. And I remember very well our president who negotiated with Netanyahu three times. Mr. Netanyahu was only lecturing on security and security and security, while we wanted to talk about refugees, borders, water, uh, good relationships. We wanted to speak about two states. We wanted to speak about good neighbors and so on and so forth. This has never been the, the case, Mr. Chairman. The other important point I want to mention to you, that there has never been really a confidence building measures between us and the Israelis. Israel has continuously destroyed measures of confidence rather than building measures of confidence. I will give you one example. When the peace process was launched in Madrid, October 1991, there were 145,000 Jewish settlers. 
Israel continued to build settlements on the Palestinian territory, and the number of Jewish settlers today is more than 720,000 Jewish settlers. They make 24% of the population of the, of, the, of the West Bank. So, and in addition to this, there are 7,000 Palestinians in Israeli prisons. Imagine a situation in which kids are put under home arrest, where mothers, they become a police women for their own children to make sure that they don't get out of the house because they might throw a stone on one soldier or in a military car and so on. There are 37 different checkpoints today in the West Bank isolating Palestinian territories from each other, and Gaza is far away from reach. Gaza has been under siege for the last 13 years. More than that, I would like also to mention to you that a future peace process needs really an honest broker. United States monopoly over the peace process has not been fruitful. We have, we have suffered a lot because, very simple, because United States is in strategic alliance with Israel. So it's United States on, its, on, on herself does not qualify to be a solo monopoly, enjoying solo monopoly over the peace process. Therefore, what we need is to have a third party who can really remedy the imbalance relationship between occupied people and an occupier country, that is Israel. I think, Mr. Chairman, that we are the party to benefit most from any serious negotiation, as I have uh, indicated. Let me take things forward to you. We have also suggested to the we have also suggested to the Israelis through different channels that we are ready to talk tomorrow. And I take the opportunity speaking to your distinguished members of parliament that we are ready, and I'm speaking not only on my capacity as prime minister, but also on behalf of my president. We are ready to resume negotiations with Israel on the basis, and we have three options, and we are ready for any of them. One option, which our president has spoken to, we are ready for an international conference based on international law and based on international legitimacy. And this international conference hosted by United Nations, United Nations herself is a member of the Quartet. Europe is a member of the Quartet. And the Russian Federation, as well as the United States. We know that without United States, there is no peace. And we know for sure that with the United States only, we are going to go anywhere. We're not going to go anywhere. So therefore, you need a formula in which Russia, United States, United Nations, and Europe, and we can add to that Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Jordan, China, whoever, but we need really a serious paradigm shift from bilateralism to multilateralism, because simply, Mr. Chairman, bilateral negotiations between us and Israel, it did not take us anywhere. So this is option one. Option two, we are ready to resume talks from where they ended. We ended these talks. Remember, we did talk with the Israelis about Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was an issue of negotiations. We did talk about with the Israelis about Palestinian refugees. We did talk about borders. We did talk about water. We did talk about cleaning or clearing Israeli prisons from Palestinian prisoners so that everybody will be released and we start a new chapter. That's second option. Third option, Mr. Chairman, I call upon you to call upon the Israelis to respect the signed agreements. If Israel is ready to respect signed agreements, we are ready to resume talks tomorrow. And we did convey this message to them and until this single minute, we didn't receive an answer. So I take this opportunity to, 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 when talking to you to, to urge you to talk, to urge you to urge Israel to come to the table and resume talks from where they ended, or an international conference, or at least they, them to declare that they are ready to respect the agreements that we have signed. So having said that, Mr. Chairman, I think for us, 
We know the situation is very complicated. We know the Middle East is not anymore the same. And we know United States is busy with its elections. And we know that in Israel, there are two governments with two heads and rather than one government with one head. And that Israel might go to fourth round of elections. Therefore, Palestinians are ready to resume talks if Israel is ready. In the meantime, we are building a national consensus on a political platform to be agreed upon by all, of, all political factions, which we have achieved. Second, we are going to bring back democracy to life. We have called more than once for elections. Unfortunately, every time and then, the Palestinian elections was blocked by Israel not allowing Palestinians to Bar from Jerusalem to participate in these elections. The Israeli-Palestinian interim agreement explicitly states that Palestinians in Jerusalem should be allowed to vote, and they did vote in the 1996 elections. They voted in the 2005 elections. They did also vote in the 2006 elections. No, so, now, <clears throat> in addition to this, Mr. Chairman, we also would like to see us and you breaking the status quo. This status quo that we live in is unsustainable. We need to break it. We need to bring things forward. Breaking the status quo, it has more than one dimension. One important issue, this Israeli occupation is making profit. This Israeli occupation, if you and us want it to end, it has to become costly. And making it costly, it means not, not profitable. Israel takes our water for free. They take our land for free. They export things without taxes. They do this and that. So this Israeli occupation makes profit rather than costly for Israel. To conclude, Mr. Chairman, I call upon your parliament and your distinguished members of this parliament that Europe, please don't wait for the American president to come up with ideas. We have you and us. We have wasted four years waiting for the American president to come up with something. He came up with something that was born dead because he didn't consult with you, because he did not consult with us, because he did not consult with Arab countries, because he consulted with nobody. Only a, a, a unilateral proposal that has come from him. So don't wait for American proposal. Be engaged with the Americans and us to come up with agreed upon terms of reference that takes things forward. Second, I hope that when we move to a different direction, recognize Palestine as a state. You are helping us on the basis of two states. Europe has believed and is still believing in two-state solution. The state of Israel is there recognize the state of Palestine in order for us and you to break the status quo. I thank you for, I thank you for all the assistance that you are giving. Europe is the most important donor for Palestine. And I thank you because you are there, your assistance there is not only about loaves of bread and assisting Palestinians on a humanitarian basis. Your assistance to us is based on two states, on political agenda. And you are helping us to build institutions, to bring democracy back. Mr. Chairman, I call upon you to get ready for observing the Palestinian elections. I hope Israel does not put any obstacle for that. I thank you for giving me the opportunity. Maybe in order for us and you to get closer, a full association agreement should be activated between Palestine and Europe. This will help Palestine to be a state. This helps Palestine to be standing on international setting. And this will help us and you to be partners for peace and justice. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak to your distinguished member of this committee. Thank you again. Your Excellency, thank you for your introductory statement. Prime Minister, I understand that we now have time until quarter to four to discuss all the issues that leaves us with approximately 55 minutes. I would suggest the following colleagues that in the first round I give the floor to the chairs of the delegations for relations with Palestine and with Israel, 
and also to our standing AFET rapporteur for Palestine and a one round of representatives of the groups. Then I will give the floor back to the Prime Minister and then we will have a second round with further colleagues who would like to take the floor. Manu Pineda chairs the Delegation for Relations with Palestine. Unfortunately, he can't be participating in this meeting, so I will give the floor to his Vice Chair, Margarete Auken. Two minutes, please. Mrs. Auken, you have the floor. Can you press the speak button? No, it had a bad connection. I don't think it will work. Okay, no connection. No, no, um, then, yes, 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 yes. yeah, okay. oh, now she's we... there. She's there. No. Sorry. Okay, yes. I wasn't, I wasn't prepared. I will get the floor. But I, uh, first and foremost, I want to thank the Prime Minister. I think he, you gave a very fair uh, description of the situation. And I also think that uh, there were no exaggerations. We are really in a very, very difficult situation. And I think that the lack of, uh, of uh, uh, possibilities for, go, for going forward is one of the real problems we have. And I want to thank Thank you for that. I also need to tell you that we are longing for see how you will arrange the elections. We absolutely agree that Jerusalem should be part of it. Of course it should, and we should, from the European Parliament, be very supportive. But I think that you should make sure that you get new people here, that you get some of your young people, some women, uh, into these elections and, and place in seats where they will be elected. We have tried that in many countries. We did it in my country, in Denmark, years back, and it was a great success. But as it is now, now, I know that you have, you have problems with having this credibility. I find your, your speech here very trustworthy, but I would like to also get a promise that you take serious that the people is longing for real elections and they are longing for having uh, real seats. So it's not, you know, the same old faces. Every time I'm there, I meet the same, well, they meet me too. I know, I know that. I've been there for 20 years. But I'm elected every time uh, in a fair way. Uh, that should be my, my second point. And uh, then uh, hopefully that you can get the support to get an honest broker, to get a time frame, to make sure that we are following international law, that we are still calling for two-state solution, the two-state solution within the 67 borders. I know it's only 22 percent of historical Palestine, but we should really be behind you there. And uh, it's repeated again and again because I see no alternative to that solution. I see no other solution than a free and sovereign state in Palestine, even within its very lim limited area and with Jerusalem as a shared capital for the two countries. Then I think we will peace for both Israel and Palestine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Auken. Um, the connection was not very good. I would guess that most of the interpreters won't have been able to interpret your English into another language. Um, the next speaker is the chair of our delegation for relations with Israel, Antonio Lopez, please. Gracias, presidente, y muchísimas gracias, primer ministro, por estar hoy presente aquí en esta comisión AFE. Yo creo que es una estupenda noticia, ¿no?, que siempre pues, puedan referirse aquí eh, cuestiones de absoluto interés para todos. Comprobará en mi intervención que yo no voy a atacarle a usted, como suelen hacer colegas de otras opciones ideológicas en este Parlamento, cuando viene algún israelí o algún israelí se eh, refiere a esta, a esta comisión. Todo lo contrario. Yo creo que como presidente de la delegación de Israel, el bienestar también del pueblo palestino eh, lo considero esencial, eh, también dentro del de orden ¿no? de las cosas en Israel. Estado, por cierto, democrático, que usted decía que ya va por sus cuartas elecciones. Yo, claro, evidentemente le aconsejaría humildemente que también haya más elecciones en Palestina, porque yo creo que eso ayuda muchísimo al proceso y a clarificar un poco la situación. ¿no? Eh, dos, eh, habla usted del cambio esperando como el maná, ¿no? la, la, el cambio de Trump por, eh, 
eh, por Biden ¿no? en el futuro, eh, a como mucha gente, mire, yo no soy un fan del señor Trump, pero sin embargo le diré que han pasado 14 presidentes de Estados Unidos con el conflicto sigue, se man, sigue manteniendo. No espere usted a que ocurra algo, una especie de milagro, sino todo lo contrario. Creo que ha hecho muy bien en su llamamiento a la Unión Europea en conjunto con Estados Unidos para aportar soluciones y siempre estaremos todos, por supuesto, disponibles. Y hay una cuestión que simplemente hay dos cuestiones que me gustaría preguntarle. Una sobre los acuerdos Abraham. He visto unas declaraciones muy negativas al respecto por su parte, ¿no? de ciertos, hacia ciertos países árabes. Y, y también sobre la cuestión de los impuestos. Ha habido una cierta confusión con nuestro alto representante en una llamada al señor Borrell a, a, a relación de esta cuestión, eh, pidiendo dinero a la Unión Europea, pero a la vez no recolectando los impuestos. ¿no? ¿Nos podría explicar un poquito esa cuestión? Yo creo que es de interés para todos y, en fin, y, eh, le deseamos lo mejor en en los próximos días y meses y esperemos que pueda haber efectivamente mejora en las relaciones. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you, Tono López. For the S&D Group, Maria Arena. Two minutes. Merci. Um... Alors c'est triste effectivement, euh, mais et je tiens à remercier Monsieur McAllister pour avoir mis euh, ce débat aujourd'hui parce que euh, c'est vrai que euh, depuis 2016, euh, il n'y a pas eu vraiment de position euh, du Conseil de l'Union européenne en ce qui concerne la situation du Proche-Orient et plus particulièrement du conflit israélo-palestinien. Euh, alors pendant ce temps, on le sait, la situation sur le terrain se détériore, les colonies continuent à se répandre, les détentions administratives se multiplient, les projets humanitaires, y compris ceux financés par l'Europe, continuent à être détruits par euh, le, euh, les Israéliens. Alors, mais comment peut-on blâmer l'Europe euh, de son inaction lorsqu'on voit les politiques américaines et celles de certains pays arabes actuellement la normalisation des relations entre Israël et les États euh, arabes unis et le Bahreïn euh, devait entraîner la suspension des colonisations. Loin de ça, il y a à peine quelques jours, les autorités israéliennes ont annoncé la création de 2500 logements supplémentaires. Comment blâner, blâmer l'Europe alors que l'Europe est aujourd'hui le premier contributeur euh, de la Palestine et le premier donateur de l'UNRWA en dépit des pressions transnationales, internationales, américaines sur l'Europe, qui n'a pas fléchi en ce qui concerne le financement de l'UNRWA. L'Europe continue de défendre la création d'un État palestinien, on l'a dit, aux côtés de l'État d'Israël, en respectant les frontières de 67 et les lois internationales. Quant à cette Assemblée, nous nous sommes exprimés à plusieurs reprises pour reconnaître effectivement l'État palestinien, pour exiger des dommages à Israël pour les projets humanitaires détruits, pour rappeler à la fin de la colonisation, pour renforcer la différenciation des politiques à l'égard d'Israël et de ses colonies. La sous-commission des droits de l'homme aura d'ailleurs à nouveau une discussion sur le sujet. La question que je pose aujourd'hui, c'est mais quelle stratégie avoir pour ne pas rester dans le statu quo, c'est effectivement ce que vous demandez, vous avez élaboré un certain nombre de pistes. Mais moi, ce que je pose, c'est la question sur les élections palestiniennes. Vous prenez euh, la question des votants de Jérusalem, il n'y a pas que ça. Comment organiser concrètement des élections quand euh, nous sommes dans la situation telle qu'elle est à Gaza Quelle est la relation entre le Fatah et le Hamas Abbas a dit en 2018, et il l'a répété en 2020, qu'il était prêt à rendre les clés à Israël et à dissoudre l'autorité palestinienne. Où en est-il aujourd'hui Merci. Thank you, Maria Arena. For the Renew Group, Madame Sarara Rodriguez Ramos. Muchas gracias. Eh, muchas gracias también eh, por su intervención. Eh, nos, ha, nos ha pedido un, eh, nuevo, un nuevo papel en este nuevo marco de referencia al que ha aludido para relanzar las negociaciones en el proceso de paz. Como usted muy bien sabe, el Parlamento Europeo eh, ha mantenido y mantiene su posición de la solución de los dos estados y hemos pedido en numerosas ocasiones la utilización de todos los instrumentos diplomáticos disponibles eh, en colaboración con Naciones Unidas para asegurar esta solución. 
la de dos estados, el Estado de Israel y el Estado de Palestina, que convivan en paz, sostenible y eficaz, sobre la base efectivamente de las fronteras de 1967, con Jerusalén como capital de ambos estados, e incluyendo un Estado palestino soberano, independiente, democrático, contiguo y viable. Por lo tanto, estamos dispuestos a, a, a trabajar, a apoyar este, 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 este impulso en este nuevo marco de referencia, apoyando claramente el multilateralismo. El reciente acuerdo entre Israel y Emiratos Árabes y Bahrein, que como usted también sabe, fue saludado por la Unión Europea, en cuanto que cualquier esfuerzo de diálogo y acuerdo nos parece que es positivo para la consecución de un oriente medio pacífico, eh, acompañó también la exigencia por parte de la Unión Europea de que no era suficiente con la suspensión de los planes de anexión por parte de Israel, sino que seguimos exigiendo que eh, estos planes de anexión ilegal de Israel de partes de Cisjordania sean claramente retirados definitivamente, porque van contra la legislación internacional, contra las resoluciones de Naciones Unidas y porque socavan la posibilidad de los dos estados, que como acabo de decir, es la única solución de paz viable que, eh, por la que apostamos y por la que estamos trabajando. Eh, quiero también señalarle que para nosotros es importantísimo estas lecciones de las que usted nos ha hablado. Quisiera colleague, saber cuáles son los principales... Perdón. Los... Excuse me, madam. Could you please come to an end? ¿Puedo, puedo, ¿Puedo realizar una pregunta? Eh, Presidente, una sola pregunta. Eh, quisiera saber la situación humanitaria en relación al COVID y cómo están afectando las demoliciones y incauteaciones de las estructuras de propiedad palestina, incluidas eh, la ayuda humanitaria de la Unión Europea en la ribera occidental, que se, ha incre se han incrementado las demoliciones durante este año. Y disculpe por el tiempo. Thank you. Anna Bonfrisco for the ID group, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Grazie, Presidente, e benvenuto al Primo Ministro Mohamed Staye. Sarò franca, Primo Ministro. Purtroppo vedo ancora diverse commissioni tra la causa palestinese, il terrorismo e l'odio tra i popoli e questo è inaccettabile per i cittadini europei. Pensare di allearsi con gli Ayatollah, con Erdogan e con il Qatar non è un atto di pace. Sostenere economicamente le famiglie di terroristi che hanno commesso crimini contro il popolo di Israele non è un atto di pace. La narrativa poi secondo la quale la soluzione al conflitto israelo-palestinese avrebbe portato pace alla regione non ha di certo impedito il conflitto siriano, quello degli Hezbollah in Libano, in Iraq e in Yemen. Allo stato attuale abbiamo la visione del Presidente Trump, gli accordi di Abramo e il principe saudita Bandar che rinfaccia alle leadership politiche palestinesi di aver sempre perso gli appuntamenti con la storia per il bene del popolo palestinese. Le chiedo quindi qual è la vostra posizione sugli accordi di Abramo? È in linea con quella dell'Unione Europea? E quali sono i vostri piani per i rifugiati palestinesi? Siete in linea con la politica europea di non finanziare ONG implicate col terrorismo? Siete d'accordo con il diritto di Israele di esistere e di essere lo Stato-nazione del popolo ebraico? Vi sentite parte di questa storia contemporanea che in questo secolo deve costruire la pace a tutti i costi? Grazie. Thank you, Madam Bonfrisco. Next for the Green Group, Jorge Soleil. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Prime Minister, for addressing us today and for expressing your readiness to resume talks and negotiations. I would also briefly comment on the so-called Abraham Accords, which have been emphatically called by the U.S. administration as peace agreement. 
I think the only agreement that will bring peace in the Middle East will, will be the one signed by Israelis and Palestinians, both with a will of it having long-lasting and profound effects. But for as long as Palestinians are denied political and civil rights, I am afraid the conflict will live on and create further instability. However, these accords seem to aim to bury the 2002 Arab Peace Initiative, which calls for recognition of Israel to be offered by Arab states in exchange for Israel's complete withdrawal from the Palestinian territories occupied since 1967. They also mean another setback after Egypt and Jordan in the Palestinian policy of Israeli isolation in the Middle East. Mr. Prime Minister, do you believe that the establishment of diplomatic relations between Israel and the United uh, Arab Emirates and Bahrain could also be a blow to the two-state solution, the solution that we also support? Moreover, are the challenges in the region, for instance, the perceived threat of Iranian expansionism, are shifting the focus and the priorities. Plus, we have seen a near collective stop of Arab aid to Palestine. Arab countries' economic contributions to the Palestinian Authority have been cut by 85% this year. Prime Minister, do you think that Arab countries have somehow lost interest in a Palestinian state? And finally, my last remark, there are conflicting reports according to which under the deal, Israel agreed to hold off annexing large portions of the West Bank. We should not be misled on that. The current occupation of, part of parts of the West Bank is already something very close to an accession. Mr. Prime Minister, do you think that Israel will honor the commitment to stop an accession as foreseen in the Trump plan? How do you see the current Israeli plans in relation to an accession? Thank you very much. Thank you. For the ECR group, Charlie Weimers, please. Thank you, Chair. Prime Minister, um, in your remarks, you mentioned that Europe is the most important donor to Palestine. And indeed, the EU has provided around 2.8 billion euros in direct aid to the PA Palestinian Authority since 2008. I represent Sweden, a country whose government recently decided to spend 1.5 billion kronor 150 million euros on financial support to the PA. Per capita, that makes Sweden one of the world's biggest donors to the PA. These vast sums of money should pr promote, and I quote the Swedish government, democracy, human rights, the rule of law, and gender equality. Now, that indeed sounds very laudable. However, Prime Minister, I'm not entirely sure whether you and your government share these progressive goals. When the EU sets up guidelines to ensure no EU funding may be used either directly or indirectly for terrorist activities, Palestinian NGOs shamelessly reject them. On uh, June 3rd, uh, 23rd, 2020, a report highlighted loopholes in EU counterterrorism financing legislation, which lead to EU funds to the PA being funneled to EU-listed terror organizations, such as the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade, the PFLP, and the Palestinian Liberation Front, all EU-listed terror organizations. You yourself have praised terrorists such as Abu Jihad. As you may imagine, Prime Minister, hardworking Swedes and other Europeans whose money you receive feel that this is an affront. Mr. Prime Minister, can you look European taxpayers in the eyes and promise that none of their money in any way, directly or indirectly, will be used for terrorism or incitement? Can you promise them that you will seize the support for terrorism and embrace peace? Thank you. Thank you. For the GUI NGL group, Marisa Matias, for two minutes. Thank you, Cher, and thank you, Prime Minister, for being here today with us. Indeed, we are talking about occupation and we are talking about a violation of international law and all the resolutions of the United Nations. And we are also talking about the silence of the European institutions since 2016, even with the moves of the United States, 
concerning the embassy in Jerusalem or with the fact that Israel didn't stop the settlements and the annexation of the Palestinian territories. So the, we, have, we, are, uh, we are facing a situation which is really unbalanced. And in that case, I think that the silence of the European Union takes part of the aggression and not of the defense of the Palestinian people. In any case, we are still waiting for the elections and for the results of the conversations, the internal conversations. So, Prime Minister, I'd like to ask you, how are the, the internal negotiations for the forthcoming elections? They have been postponed several times. It would be good for us to know if there are um, internal negotiations now uh, when it comes to the uh, elections. Again, uh, I also would like to ask you uh, if you have any signs that Israel might be ready for resume the talks. As you said, that you, the Palestinians are ready for that. But do you see from the Israeli side any movement concerning their capacity or will to resume the talks? Thank you so much. Thank you, Marisa Matias. For the non inscri Fabio Castaldo, two minutes. Thank you all very much, Chair, Your Excellency, Prime Minister Shtayeh. For decades, the Arab-Israeli conflict was in the Middle East's primary geopolitical fault line. The recent uh, UAE and Bahrain deals with Israel, however, shows that it is no longer the case and that a free Palestine is no longer the conditio sine qua non for the normalization of relationship between Israel and the Arab world. Palestinian people then are still facing an existential threat that jeopardizes their rights of freedom and self-determination. So it is more than ever crucial for Palestinians to step up together and show a peaceful but strong commitment. And the announcement of general elections is an important step in this sense and fundamental to end divisions and engage in legitimacy and reconciliation. For these elections to be successful, all political factions must engage in a serious dialogue and agree on the legal technical aspects of the electoral process, as a failure to do, to do so might further fuel divisions and hinder the current path to reunification through elections. However, even if the Palestinian factions prove to be united, conducting elections in the Palestinian territories still faces serious obstacles, most notably Israel's, Israel's military occupation of East Jerusalem and the West Bank. That's the reason why the EU must support the Palestinian Authority in this endeavor and deploy an EOM as soon as possible to monitor and facilitate mediation within the Palestinian factions, and at the same time use all, all its diplomatic tools to convince Israeli authorities to facilitate the peaceful holding of elections in all the Palestinian territories, including the Gaza Strip and East Jerusalem. The hope is that a united Palestinian front will be in a better place to finally have meaningful, constructive and fair negotiations with Israel and to make those positive steps that the international community has been waiting for years. I really would like to know what do you think in this regard on the crucial role of our mission on the ground. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fabio Castaldo. And to conclude our first round, I give the floor to the standing rapporteur and AFID, Evin Inchia, please. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for briefing on the current situation, Prime Minister. As always, it's a pleasure to be seeing you, even though this time it's virtually. For us Social Democrats, being indifferent in a time of oppression and injustice is never an option. The Palestinian people have suffered enough. We will continue to fight for the end of occupation for two independent and democratic states, Israel and Palestine, side by side in peace and security. You can maybe call me a dreamer if you want, but as my government recognized Palestine as one of its first steps in 2014, I hope that more EU member states would have done the same. Unfortunately, the development has been disappointing. As we continue the struggle for recognition of Palestine also here in the European Parliament, we also struggle for a fully-fledged democratic Palestine. There is a vital yet parallel process. We have far too many unsuccessful examples where democracy has been put on hold. In this, I know that we have a friend, of, a friend in you, and I know that the Palestinian people has a friend in you. However, words must be put into action. It's a matter of advancing fundamental rights, rule of law, and democracy. Therefore, I welcome the agreement on general elections throughout Palestine. Yet, most of us, I think, are wondering, will it really happen this time? 
There will, of course, be challenges, but democracy never comes easy. I'm fully aware of the challenges you are facing under the occupation, but if there is a will, there is always a way. The first time I was in Palestine was actually after the elections of 2016, 15 years ago. Since then, I have visited both Israel and Palestine almost every year. Unfortunately, no elections have taken place during this time. I hope that for the next visit, I will be able to see the Palestinian people having enjoying general elections, having, uh, exercising their rights of free and fair elections, which is the heart, in the heart of democracy. P, uh, PM Steyer, I have three questions. One, will the elections really happen? Two, how can EU facilitate this process? And finally, how do you envision to involve young people and women in decision making through voting? But foremost, how will you ensure their representation? Representation is a matter of credibility and democracy must be firmly an anchored among the population. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Prime Minister, 10 colleagues took the floor and asked many, many questions. May I ask you now to try and answer these 10 contributions from colleagues in 10 minutes, because there are so many other colleagues who would also like to take the floor in a second round. The floor is yours, Your Excellency. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I really appreciate the interventions by your colleagues. I think most of them, they did really hit the nail on its head. And I think all the questions are very relevant. <clears throat> now, on the issue of elections, because most of the speakers have actually touched upon that, look, Palestinians, we live in a very unusual situation. <clears throat> when things are possible, we had student union elections in every university. We had Chamber of Commerce elections in every uh, city, and we have municipal elections in every village, in every town, and every municipality. So for us, this issue of elections and democratization of the Palestinian society is a survival strategy for me personally. A person who comes from a very democratic environment believes truly in this process because I look at election and democratization of the Palestinian society as a really a survival strategy. Now, <clears throat> in our case, we are not the only player in this. Unfortunately, Palestinians are divided between West Bank and Gaza, Hamas and Fatah, and so on and so forth. And this split has been ongoing for 13 years. Now we have come to ground and we have decided with the regional players that this is a must and we need to come to it. I want to remind you, my dear friends, that we are not going to the political platform of Hamas. We are bringing Hamas to our political platform in two-state solution, on peaceful resistance, in avoiding violence, in all these things that we have agreed upon. So democratization of the society and elections is a must. And we will work hard. Remember, and you are right, there has been so many disappointments, simply because when, when we declare that we are going to have elections, it is not all the time in our hands. We cannot, we cannot under any circumstances, have elections without participation of the Palestinians in Jerusalem. Because if we do so, then as if we are recognizing Jerusalem as not to be part of Palestine. So therefore, <clears throat> we hope that the moment a presidential decree is published on the date of elections, I hope that you make every effort to really put pressure on Israel to allow our people in Jerusalem to vote. We have taken measures really to avoid that if Israel does not allow it. We don't want to be hostages to only to Israeli veto and Israeli no. The Palestinian election law, the new election law, deals with West Bank and Gaza as one constituency. The Palestinian election law, it, it, it's, uh, it consider it's, a it's based on lists. Each political party has a list, so therefore there will be no geographic, geographical constituencies. And I think that's very important. So Palestinians in Jerusalem, they can be in the list, whether Israel will allow them to vote or not, we will find a way for that. <clears throat> but this is, we are going to have a legislative council elections, we are going to have a presidential elections, and we are going to have a BNC, which is a BLO parliament election. So this is where we are heading. 
The other important point <coughs> that has been raised by uh, one of the colleagues <coughs> there, Mr. Antonio Lebo Lopez, on the issue of taxes and uh, tax clearance. This money, sir, is our money. <coughs> and this money is due to us. It's not that we don't want it. It is simply because Israel is putting conditions on giving us our own money. Because we don't control borders, Israel actually collect our taxes on our behalf, and they should transfer this to us under no condition whatsoever. When we applied for ICC, Israel did freeze the transfer of the money. When we did apply for United Nations membership, Israel did freeze the transfer of this money. So Israel is really taking our money as a political tool, as a political blackmail. We don't accept that. So therefore, my dear friend, if you are a, uh, if you are a friend of Israel, tell them to give us the money without any condition. We will immediately take it the minute after. Now, I, am not, I never said that American president is an impediment to peace. I said that the American president should facilitate peace. United States should be a broker. United States should not align itself to one party at the expense of the other. And the problem in Palestine is not America. The problem in Palestine is Israeli occupation. And there are every American president tried to solve this problem. Unfortunately, Israel has never been cooperating with American presidents. Listen to what President Obama said. Listen to what President Clinton said. Listen to all American, what American presidents said. That but we have never been an impediment to this. Just simply all what we wanted is our full rights in the right of self-determination in an independent, sovereign, viable Palestinian state. That is what we are calling for. On the issue of uh, the settlements, I think you are very right. It is very important. We see a total erosion of two states by the fact that Israel is building settlements. The settlements is a real enemy for peace. Settlements is a real enemy for two states. And settlements are actually increasing every day. And I know that you have taken serious measures in labeling settlement products, not to uh, uh, settlement products uh, exported from here to Europe. I hope that you take a further measure that you should not allow settlement products, because I said earlier that this Israeli occupation should be costly under any circumstances. One important issue that has to do with normalization of relations between Arab countries and Israel. This is the, this is the normal peace process. The Arab Peace Initiative did call for normalization of relations between Arabs and Israel. But unfortunately, that was part of it. The, the, the Arabs all in 2002 have agreed on Arab Peace Initiative, which simply called for Israeli withdrawal from the territories she occupied in 1967, i.e. Palestinian territory, including the Golan Heights, in return of a full normalization of Arab-Israeli relationships. And that is where we stand until now. And by the way, normalizing relations between the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Israel, if you listen, if you listen to the King of Bahrain speaking yesterday, he said Bahrain is in full support with Palestinian rights. Bahrain is in full support with the Arab Peace Initiative. Bahrain is in full support with two-state solution. So having certain calculated self-interest of certain Arab countries does not really come at the expense of Palestine. Why we were angry? We were not happy. It's very simple because we wanted this process to be collective, not individual cases. We wanted people to really respect the, the, the Arab Peace Initiative. The, the other important issue I should uh, mention, look, my dear friend, speaking about refugees, Jerusalem, and so on and so forth. Look, if you want a comprehensive solution for Palestine, we have to tackle all issues. Uh, leaving borders, leaving Jerusalem, leaving refugees aside, it doesn't help us at all. Now, I am not a person who is sitting on modern history, my dear friend. I am a person who looks at the future. I am not a hostage of history. But if we don't learn from history, we will never draw conclusions for tomorrow. And that is why, when we look at the situation today, I look at the situation in the eyes of the Palestinian children. I look at the situation in the eyes of the Israeli children. I look at the situation in the eyes of tomorrow. Because we are not hostages to the moment. The moment is terrible. The status quo is difficult. The status quo is miserable for the Palestinians. And seriously, 
If we want anything, we need to look at tomorrow. What is tomorrow for us? Tomorrow for me is a situation in which I can have access to the Mediterranean Sea for a vacation. Tomorrow for me is a situation in which I live freely with dignity in an independent Palestinian state. Tomorrow for me is Palestine without occupation. Tomorrow for me that I can travel to Europe through a Palestinian airport or through a Palestinian seaport. Tomorrow for me is a situation in which internet becomes to every house and not Palestinians in Gaza are still working with G2 and the whole world is talking about G5 and G4 and so on and so forth. So I'm not a hostage of the moment. I am a person who looks at tomorrow under any circumstances. Funding terrorism, my dear friend from Sweden, I thank the taxpayers of Sweden. And I thank Sweden for taking the lead in Europe to recognize Palestine, because the Swedish government who did so, you did stand with peace and justice at a very historical moment, and you, you, you will be judged on that. Palestinian leadership has never accepted terrorism. This term is not in our mind. We are calling for peaceful resistance, two states negotiating, international law. That is what we stand for. And your assistant to us, I want to assure you, and I want to look on your eyes, and I want to challenge you if any single penny from any international aid ever gone to any terrorist organization, as you claim. That's not right, sir. I think it is very unfair to the taxpayers of Sweden, to the taxpayer of, you, of Europe, whom I thank all of them for all the support that they give. You are supporting poor people in the refugee camps. You are supporting be, be hospital, sick people in the East Jerusalem hospital. You are supporting a, creating a culture of democracy and protection of human rights. You are supporting building institutions for two states, which you stand for, which you believe in. That is where your money goes. It goes for poor farmers. It goes for building schools. It goes for creating a culture of living together. It goes for fighting mosquitoes. It goes for medicine. It goes for fighting corona, which is an international benefit. It is not simply, it is unfair to say that some of this money goes to terrorist organization here and there. It's totally unfair to us. It is it's unfair to the Swedish taxpayers as well. Now, annexation, I think every settlement that is built on Palestinian territory is a proposal for annexation. And that is why when we call for ending the settlement, settlements, we are ending the annexation. Israel designed settlements are designed to be creeping annexation, gradual annexation. Trump wanted all in one go, 30% of the West Bank. Neither creeping annexation is a solution, nor the proposal by Trump is a solution. But the solution is two states on the borders of six or seven. Is Israel ready for that? To be frank with you, we don't see, we don't see a partner in Israel today. I am extending my hand and the hand of our president for any prime minister in Israel, for the current prime minister of Israel, for Mr. Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel, to stand up in front of you, the parliamentarians of Europe, and say that he is ready to end the occupation that has, been, that has occurred on the Palestinian territory since 1967. That is all what we want, somebody to have the courage to say that I'm ready to end occupation, not to play games here and there, not to find justification for manifestation of occupation and so on. I assure you, ladies and gentlemen, that Palestine will be different. Democracy is our goal, and the occupation as well. And for us, the democratization of the, or the elections, next election is not going to be about reproducing myself or whoever. We want to see a new bloodshed, a new blood injected in the system. I want to see youth, women, uh, geographical distribution, people from Jerusalem, from Gaza, from the rest of the West Bank, all under the parliament, all for peace and justice, all to be partners with you for the sake of a peaceful Mediterranean in which all countries live in peace and justice. My dear friend, we did recognize Palestine. We, we did recognize Israel. Yasser Arafat exchanged letters of recognition with Ishaq Rabin, September 9th, 1993. Unfortunately, until this single minute, Israel does not recognize Palestine. So the issue, the question is not only to me whether we recognize Israel or not. The question is that I, we do recognize Palestine. I'm telling you that. Can you ask the Israelis whether they do recognize Palestine 
or not? Can you ask the Israelis, where are the borders of Israel? Can you ask the Israelis, what is their political platform for ending the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? That is what is the problem. That is where the problem is. End of occupation, that is the answer. Thank you, Prime Minister. I would like to give the floor to conclude the session, the second round. I have colleagues in total six requests to take the floor. If we keep it to about one minute, then we can perhaps get it done. The first is David Lega for the EPP. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to Mr. Steyer for having this exchange of views with us here today. So I would like to hear your view about Israel's security concerns, Mr. Prime Minister, because Israel, just like any other sovereign state, has an obligation to ensure the safety and security of its citizens. So, Mr. Prime Minister, a perceived sense of insecurity and unsafety is indeed a real sense of insecurity and unsafety. And it's important to remember that when Israel reached out in the 1990s, it was met with suicide bombers. And more recently, Israel's willingness to compromise was met with knife attacks targeting civilians. So, Mr. Prime Minister, given, given the current situation, which steps are you ready to take to decrease the Israeli sense of insecurity and unsafety? Because I believe that the safety of Palestinians and Israelis must be a matter of common concern to all of us. Israelis and Palestinians joining forces is indeed the key to create a safer and more secure Israel. Thank you. Thank you, David. Next is Giuliano Pisapia. Grazie, Primo Ministro della Palestina. È un piacere averla qui con noi in Commissione Affari Esteri, vista anche l'importanza storica di nuove elezioni palestinesi. Grazie per aver ribadito qua al Parlamento Europeo la disponibilità a riprendere i negoziati e la volontà di unità e di pace del popolo palestinese. È ora di far diventare realtà la speranza di un futuro migliore e più giusto all'insegna della pace e della democrazia, nel rispetto dello Stato di Israele, ma anche nel rispetto dei diritti del popolo palestinese. Le elezioni costituiranno un passo fondamentale nel processo di autodeterminazione del popolo palestinese e proprio per questo saranno importanti l'Unione Europea, il Parlamento Europeo, dove fare di tutto per affinché queste elezioni siano, come noi prevediamo, democratiche se ci sarà la possibilità di farle, di dare ai cittadini palestinesi, al popolo palestinese la possibilità di andare a decidere i loro leader, chi li deve portare nel percorso della pace. Una domanda specifica che mi sembra non sia stata ancora toccata, qual è stata la reazione dei paesi terzi e in, paese, e in particolare dei paesi arabi ai tentativi di riconciliazione fra Fatah e Hamas tra il popolo palestinese? Vi è stato supporto, dissenso o vi è stato silenzio? Grazie ancora per essere qua e per il suo impegno e per il vostro impegno per la pace e la solidarietà. Thank you. Thank you. Next is for the Renew Group, our colleague Federica Ries. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Mr. Prime Minister. It's an honor to have you with us since we obviously share all the uh, same objective, peace, uh, security and stability for both Israel and, and Palestine. I would like to come back, if you allow me, to the Abraham Accords that you recently called in a press review a clear and shameful breach with the Arab position. And uh, I quote you a few remarks on this, that issue. You will have noticed that High Representative Youssef Borrell reacted to these latest developments, calling them, and I quote again, a contribution to peace and stability in the Middle East. This on behalf of the European Union that has always maintained equidistance in the conflict throughout the years. Because the truth, Mr. Prime Minister, is um, everything has failed from Oslo to Camp David, from Daba to Daba, sorry, to, to Geneva. Nothing has worked for almost 30 years, and I could mention 48. So, I'm sure you agree that the status quo, I have no clock, Mr. President, so I don't know where I stand. Uh, I'm sure you agree that the status quo is not an option. You called it totally unsustainable. Now, a dynamic has been initiated 
by the Emirates, by Bahrain, and other countries that are said to be now in the pipeline, Sudan, Oman, Saudi Arabia seems to be hesitating between two, trends, two tendencies. But that, Saudi Arabia, would be a real game changer, a real quantum leap. And the direct talks between Lebanon and Israel on their maritime borders adds another layer uh, to the process. Coming to the question, here comes the question, and I guess you're going to say no, but I have to ask, can you understand that for us, for the international community, for the observers, and for the honest believers in a comprehensive two-state solution, this is a French momentum that has to be seized. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. Thank you, dear colleague. Next is Dietmar Köster. You can press the speak button, sir. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Prime Minister, for your presentation. The Israeli political scientist, author, and previous member of the Knesset, Einat Wilf and Adi Schwarz, published a book called The War of Return. The authors are initiating a public debate that the biggest problem of the Middle East conflict is not a territor territorial question. The biggest obstacle is the demand of the Palestinians to carry out the right of return of the Palestinians. This would mean that millions of refugees and their decent descendants of Palestinians could return to Israel. And we are know about we are aware about the impact of such a development. This would reverse ultimately the establishment of the State of Israel. Having this in mind, how can we achieve a peaceful two-state solution? And uh, I want to, look, want to know your opinion on this. Thank you. Thank you, Dietmar Köster. Salima Yenbu, please. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Monsieur le Ministre, Euh, je me réjouis euh, de deux choses, de cet entretien euh, enfin avec vous et euh, aussi du processus, processus électoral à venir. J'ai quelques questions. Quelle stratégie envisagez-vous pour inclure les femmes et les jeunes aux élections Ces jeunes qui, pour la plupart, n'ont jamais pu voter de leur vie. Comment renouveler concrètement le, le système politique Et quelle aide euh, de l'Union européenne au processus électoral euh, pourriez-vous envisager ou souhaitez-vous Je m'adresse aussi au, au SEAE. Est-ce que vous pourriez nous confirmer l'intention de l'Union européenne d'observer les élections futures euh, Comment, la même question, hein, comment l'Union européenne euh, compte-t-elle aider concrètement à la tenue d'élections euh, en Palestine, mais aussi à Jérusalem-Est euh, Est-ce qu'il est prévu et qu'est-ce qu'il est prévu pour éviter le scénario des dernières élections où l'Union européenne s'est discréditée en constatant que les élections avaient été conformes aux normes internationales, mais qui avait refusé d'en reconnaître les résultats Euh, une dernière question, la Norvège, la Suisse, la Suisse entre autres, euh, dialogue avec toutes les parties palestiniennes, palestiniennes pardon. ne serait-il pas temps euh, que l'Union européenne se donne les moyens euh, d'être un véritable acteur euh, diplomatique en parlant avec tous Y a-t-il une discussion à ce sujet euh, au Conseil Et puis, que faisons-nous au sujet des produits des colonies euh, importés euh, chez nous Merci beaucoup. Thank you, and to conclude, Mick Wallace. Thank you very much, President. Uh, Prime Minister, uh, you, um, you asked if our President would call on Israel to respect the signed agreements, but you were making excuses for Clinton and Obama. And you say Israel is the obstacle to peace, not the US. But would you not agree that Israel can only do what it does uh, with the compliance of the US and EU? Given that the US and EU have stood idly by as Israel continued to expand the illegal occupation, what chance is there of getting back to the 67 borders? The renowned scholar Ali Abunma has said that the two-state solution is impossible in, as the settlements stand. Do you really think that you can get back to the 67 border? And listen, I mean, do you not think as well, right? Ye have cooperated with Israel. Have ye not acted as, like a security force in the West Bank for Israel? Have ye ever handed Palestinians over to the Israeli forces? 
Can you answer me that, please? Thank you. Colleagues, I see no further requests to speak, so I ask the Prime Minister once again to answer many of our questions, and we will have to close this meeting in about eight minutes. Prime Minister, the floor is yours. Thanks uh, very much, uh, my dear friend. Let me uh, just uh, uh, start by the first question. Look, of course, we understand the Israeli security concerns. But if you think that security brings security, you are wrong, sir. I think security can be achieved through, through peaceful agreements, through not having an hungry neighbor. Security measures can be, can be handled with peaceful measures and ending the conflict. It just simply, this situation in which Israel cares only for its security, we also care for, care for our, the security of our people. And that is where we need to sit down and settle this issue. Now, in the same way that you want me to assure the Israelis, I want to assure our people as well. I want the Israelis to assure our people that we will live in peace and justice in this, Palestine, in this Palestinian territory that will be the state of Palestine. In the same way that we have proposed so many things, including a demilitarized state of Palestine, we did do that. And with this was put on the table. So the issue is not really about Israel being worried and afraid. Israel is a superpower. Israel has all the military means. And Israel can, has occupied Arab territories, Sinai, the Golan Heights, the Gaza Strip, West Bank, Jerusalem, all of this. Palestinians never occupied one single inch of Israel. So therefore, it is we who need to be assured on our own future, on our security, and living in an independent, sovereign, viable Palestinian state. The issue of Arab countries from uh, on uh, the Arab position on reconciliation, we have received very good messages. Qatar is there, Egypt is there, Jordan is there. I'm sure the Saudis will be very happy for that. So, yes, sir, I think Arabs will be very happy to see Palestinians united. Now, on the issue of, you know, normalization and whether there is this an opportunity or not. Look, my dear friend, peace for peace doesn't work. The issue, Israel is not occupying United Arab uh, Emirates territory. And Israel is not occupying a Saudi territory. At the end of the day, if we want peace, then we know what is the answer. The answer is land for peace, not peace for peace. And the answer is not you impose peace and what Mr. Netanyahu was calling, we have the power to make peace. You make peace with compromise. You make peace with understanding. You, base, you make peace with agreement, not by imposing peace. And that is where, could you kindly tell me what is the opportunity that we are missing today? What is the opportunity really that we are missing today through the normalization of Arab-Israeli relationship? If Israel is ready to say that it is ready to end its occupation on the basis of Arab peace initiative, and we said, no, I will tell you that we are missing an opportunity and we, I will not allow that. And our president will not allow that. We will seize every opportunity possible. And I assure you, madam, that there is no opportunity whatsoever on this. The real opportunity is land for peace. The real opportunity is end occupation. The real opportunity is when the Arab Peace Initiative is fully implemented. That is what is the real opportunity. And if we miss that, I will be more than happy if you accuse us by saying there is, you missed an opportunity. On the issue of refugees, my dear friend, look, don't be misled with Israeli propaganda that there, are, there will be millions of Palestinians influxing into Israel. That will not be the case. But sol solving the Palestinian-Israeli question or conflict without solving the issue of refugees, you are not going to go anywhere. Let me tell you one important thing. How many Palestinians are there with Daesh? How many Palestinians are there with ISIS? How many Palestinians are there with Al-Qaeda? Nobody, nobody, none one single, how many Palestinians were there in September 11? None one single Palestinian, because Palestinians are not terrorists. Palestinians are fighting for their right 
of self-determination to live in an independent, sovereign Palestinian state. For the refugees, we have offered Israel five options. And a Clinton initiative is there, and the minutes of meetings under Clinton are there. Ask Shlomo bin Ami, he is there, he used to be the foreign minister of the state of Israel. We were very progressive on putting a solution for the refugees. We did say that solving the, the refugee issue is to be agreed upon. Some Palestinians will prefer to come back to the state of Palestine. Some Palestinians might like to stay wherever they are. And we will agree with Israel how many Palestinians will go back to their original homes. That is the issue. So therefore, the issue is not about 8 million Palestinians going back to Israel. It is not the case. Please don't be misled with that. We are talking about agreed upon solution because without solving the refugee problem, there will be no solution. And I assure you one important thing. Every single election that we did conduct, we respected the results. In 2006, I was the minister of three ministries. I was the minister of housing and public works. I was a minister of labor and was a minister of social affairs. I have handed three keys to three ministers of Hamas because we accepted the results of elections. Unfortunately, Hamas was not qualified to be acceptable by the international community. That's a different story. So therefore, I hope that the international community will accept Hamas. I, I hope Hamas does not win the elections. We are working, of course, we are going for elections to win elections. But even if we don't, we are ready to accept the results. And I assure you that Hamas today has, as I said earlier, they did come to our platform politically. We are not going to their platform politically. And on the issue of settlement products, yes, it is very important. Labeling settlement products is not enough. Israel has to pay the price for that. And for the last speaker, I, my dear friend, look, we have an agreement with Israel. Security coordination is not about handing Palestinians to the Israelis. It's about Israelis running away from Israel into the West Bank. We will send them back. It's about Israel respecting the agreement that Palestinian territory zone is not about to be, uh, to be encouraged into by Israeli forces. Palestinian security coordination with Israel is based about, it's about an ambulance that wants to go into Jerusalem. It's about a sick person who wants to travel to Jordan. It's about exporting products because we don't have a seaport, <clears throat> because we don't have an airport. That is what security coordination is. And it is about maintaining peace and justice. And that is what we wanted. So this propaganda that Palestinian leadership or Palestinian authority is handing Palestinians to Israel, we are not an agent, an Israeli security agent, my dear friend. Palestinian leadership is an integral part of historical leadership of Palestine. We are here to fight for our rights, for peace and justice, for ending occupation, for the establishment of an independent, sovereign, viable Palestinian state on the border of 67 with Jerusalem as its capital. That is what we stand for. But when we sign that agreement, we will respect it. The problem is not what we do. The problem is what Israel is doing. And what Israel is doing is violating every, every agreement. And what Israel is doing is destroying two-state solution. And what Israel is doing is really a violation of international law. Stand with us, stand with international law, stand for peace and justice. I know you do. I thank you for all what you are doing. Europe has been very generous in its support with two states. And your money, sir, I assure you, it falls into the right direction. And you have all the mission on the ground to check, to have all the checks and balances, to make sure that every single penny is spent in the right way in the most transparent way. Don't fall victim of the Israeli propaganda that this money is, is misused and this and that. I assure you, I am a responsible person. We all stand for one goal. In the same way that I would like to see the Israeli children living in peace and justice, I would like also to see Palestinian children swimming peacefully in the Mediterranean Sea or in the Dead Sea, which until this single minute, we don't have access to. Support us to achieve this. 
and make things possible and make Palestine an integral part of international system, international political arena. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, we now conclude this item. I would like to thank all participants and especially His Excellency the Prime Minister for this interesting exchange of views. I think, Prime Minister, the many colleagues who took the floor have shown you how large interest there is in this parliament in dealing with your country. Colleagues, I would like to give also a big thanks to our interpreters who agreed to stay longer than planned. Thank you very much. We come to item number 10. Any other business? There's nothing from your side. And then I can finally inform you that our next meeting will be in two weeks, on Monday the 26th of October from 9 to 11, from quarter to 2 to quarter to 4, and from quarter to 5 to quarter to 7 here in Brussels. Once again, thank you, Prime Minister, for participating, and our meeting is now closed. <laughs>